This video was produced in collaboration with the Penn Museum. 100 years ago, an incredible discovery was made under the sands of the Iraqi desert. Hidden among the ruins of an ancient city, a vast royal cemetery was found after 4,600 years of oblivion. The long-forgotten wonders in these tombs have allowed us to reconstruct fragments of the lives of the ancient Sumerian people. This is a story of life and death. This is the story of Queen Puabi. My name is Sarah. Welcome to the Mists of Time. Nestled in the southern heart of Iraq, for millennia, the city of Ur has been one of the most important urban centers in the world. What is now an arid and sandy plain was once a lush and thriving city. However, time has not been kind to Ur, slowly causing it to lose its strategic position, and it was gradually abandoned. The city's secrets remained concealed when if the sands of time. In 1850, the remnants of Earth's colossal ziggurat were finally uncovered. Despite the revelation of this impressive structure, Ur remained unexplored for many decades, until in 1922, a joint expedition headed by the Penn and British Museums was prepared to uncover the secrets of Ur. The archaeological undertaking was led by Leonard Woolley, an accomplished archaeologist who had already made a name for himself. He had led excavations across the globe, from his native United Kingdom to Egypt, Syria and Sudan. At the time, archaeology as a field was still in its early stages, and Woolley is regarded as one of the first true scientific archaeologists. Rather than simply seeking out lost treasures, he meticulously documented everything he uncovered. As his team plunged into the depths of Earth, they stumbled upon a wealth of small golden objects. This spot would eventually be dubbed the Gold Trench. Woolley understood the immense significance of this find, but also recognized the importance of being careful. Rather than immediately excavating the Gold Trench, he spent four years investigating other areas of the city, waiting for his team to learn the necessary expertise. In that very same year, the grandiose tomb of Tutankhamun had been uncovered in Egypt. It was the first time a pharaoh's burial site had been unearthed with all its treasures still intact. The world was captivated by this revelation, and there was a strong urge to rival this momentous discovery with an equally impressive find from ancient Mesopotamia. However, Woolley chose to exercise caution. Finally, in 1926, Woolley was ready to dig the gold trench, which turned out to be part of a vast burial ground that Woolley named the Royal Cemetery of Earth. Slowly but surely, this initial trench became a huge one, more than 70 meters or 230 feet wide. Over the course of their excavations, the archaeologists uncovered 1,850 tubes, each one revealing a piece of the city's rich history. Though many of the tombs had been looted or destroyed over time, Woolley estimated that there were originally over 4,000 in the cemetery, which had been in use for three centuries. In these tombs, the deceased person rested for eternity in their clothing or perhaps wrapped in a shroud. They always held drinking cups made of metal, stone or clay, and the jar was nearby as well. These great goods were meant for drinks and food to sustain the person in the afterlife. Weeks turned into years, and Woolley and his team labored tirelessly to excavate the remains of Earth's inhabitants, until one day they uncovered 16 exceptional burials. 
These individuals had been laid to rest in chambers constructed of stone or bricks. The few grave goods that ancient looters had missed were astonishingly opulent. Woolley labeled these burials as royal tombs. In 1927, five years after starting to work at her, Woolley and his team discovered one of the most exceptional tombs in the royal cemetery. He called it PG-800. It contained some of the best preserved artifacts of the whole cemetery. Although the vaulted roof had collapsed, the team was amazed at what they discovered after removing soil and bricks. The tomb contained a barrel of a woman who was adorned with incredible jewels. Additionally, there were rich offerings scattered throughout the tomb. Close to the woman's shoulder, the archaeologists found three cylinder seals, which were a type of rolling stamp used as a signature in ancient Mesopotamia. One of the seals bore the name of the tomb's owner, revealing her identity as Queen Puabi. Very close to PG-800, there was another tomb that had been looted in antiquity. Voli thought that there was a clear story here. When Queen Puabi died, she wanted to be buried close to her late unnamed husband. Voli was a very serious archaeologist, but sometimes he liked a good story too much. In reality, the two tombs are not directly related and with the little evidence we have, we can't offer any explanation on why they were built so closely. Queen Puabi's cylinder seal was particularly unique for its time. It made no reference to a husband, which was unusual in early Mesopotamia, where even the most important women were typically identified in relation to their spouses. Although women held positions of power and amassed significant wealth, this was still a heavily patriarchal society. Puabi being identified solely as a queen rather than as a wife suggests that she may have ruled in her own right. The tomb of Queen Puabi was incredibly opulent, containing a wealth of precious artifacts. It is no wonder that Vuli was very worried about the safety of the excavation site. Despite his concerns, he couldn't keep the discovery under wraps. So he planned a smart ploy to break the news. He sent a telegram to the Penn Museum, but he wrote it in ancient Latin. Very few persons, apart from the museum curators, could understand the message. The fewer people who knew about the great treasure trove in the desert, the better. When the treasure was moved to a safe place, the news spread like a wildfire. The world was captivated by the discovery and the public followed Bully's work for years to come. When Puabi died, she was around 40 years old. Her body was adorned with an elaborate headdress, featuring a large wig wrapped in 12 meters or 39 feet of gold ribbons. Puabi wore a frontlet of large gold rings and precious beads. She also had three wreaths of gold leaves and flowers made of lapis lazuli and carnelian stones, which represented the fertility and abundance of ancient Mesopotamia. Lastly, a decorative comb topped the headdress, giving the queen a proud and majestic appearance. The whole of her body was covered by a cloak made of beads of gold, silver, lapis lazuli, carnelian and agate. She had an equally impressive belt as well. Three large gold pins secured her dress. From these pins, her cylinder seals were hanging. At her ears, she had a pair of impressive half-moon-shaped earrings. Finally, she had rings and a bracelet. In total, she had almost six kilograms or 13 pounds of jewelry. Close to her body, there was a small table on which thousands of minuscule lapis lazuli with some gold pendants were scattered. Woolly thought it was the queen's diadem, but its reconstruction has been proved wrong. Lately, archaeologists think they were three different headdresses. The pendants represent animals and fruits as signs of Earth's wealth and fertility. Close to her hips, there were four typically male headdresses, 
quite likely gifts intended for the gods that she would have met in death. This unique treasure escaped looters for millennia. Sadly, the tomb roof had collapsed, crushing jewels and bones. So it's quite hard to precisely know how the queen won her jewels. Her headdress was reconstructed by Vuli and his wife, but when it arrived at the Penn Museum, it was rearranged in a different reconstruction proposal, only to be put together in its final form years later. Archaeologists and curators are confident that this reconstruction is mostly correct. But we may never know some details, such as how her dress looked or what kind of makeup she wore. However, it is undeniable that Queen Puabi was a very powerful woman. The gold and semi-precious stones tell a story of great wealth and international connections. None of these materials can be found in Mesopotamia and had to be imported from far away. Gold and silver were imported from what is now Turkey, Azerbaijan and Iran. Carnelian stones came from India, while lapis lazuli came from modern-day Afghanistan. Ur was the center of a vast international trading network. It is unclear what the Sumerians gave in exchange for all this wealth. But the advanced local textile industry likely played a significant role. Ur was not different from the other Sumerian cities of the time, but it had a great advantage, its strategic location. In Puabi's time, the city was located where the Euphrates River emptied into the sea. Over the centuries, the river changed its course, and the shoreline moved more than 240 kilometers or 150 miles. A thriving seaport city became ruins in an arid plain. Queen Puabi was not alone in her tomb. Vuli and his team discovered two women who had been buried with her. They were clearly maids, dressed similarly to the queen. A man was also buried with them, identified by his dagger and the whetstone. The majority of Sumerian people were buried with a drinking cup. Puabi's own silver cup was astonishing. Beside it, there was a solid gold drinking straw. Sumerian beer, in fact, had a lot of floating particulates due to the way it was made from bread. So drinking beer with a straw was very convenient. Scattered around the tomb, there were pieces of Puabi's life. For example, her beautiful makeup containers are very well preserved. Puabi's fineries and her personal attendants were meant to give the queen a comfortable afterlife. Ancient Mesopotamians, in fact, thought that the netherworld was a dark and dusty place, where its inhabitants ate soil and clay. For this reason, bowls and containers full of food and drinks were buried with the queen. Also, daily libation rituals were performed to sustain the ancestors' souls. A great queen like Puabi was accustomed to a comfort that was unthinkable for the average person of the time. This is why each of the royal tombs of Ur had what Wooly named a death pit. The archaeologists, in fact, unearthed evidence of human sacrifices. Outside each tomb, the entire royal court was buried to keep serving their overlord in the afterlife. Vuli found 21 people in what he thought was Puabi's death pit. In recent years, it has been evaluated that Puabi's sacrificed retinues haven't been found, and PG-800's death pit belongs to another two. But Vuli was quite convinced that these people had followed the Queen of Ur in her death. It's quite likely that Puabi's death pit was deeper in the ground, but Vuli never looked for it. The people buried in the death pit were aligned to represent a funeral feast. In death, the court had to appear as it appeared in life. Around them, there were drinks and food. Music was extremely important for Sumerian banquets, and stunning lyres have been found in the death pits. 
the archaeologists found five armed guards with their daggers. In addition, there was a vehicle, a sort of donkey-drafted sledge with five people around the two animals. Nearby, there was a large decorated wooden chest, and Voli thought it was the Queen's wardrobe. He believed that it was moved by some thieves to hide the big hole they had dug in the floor to loot what he thought was Poavi's husband's tomb. There were also ten women with a lyre, probably dancers and musicians for the banquet. Bully strongly believed that the retainers willingly embraced death. In his opinion, they consumed poison and calmly awaited their inevitable fate, while simultaneously upholding the ceremonial duties of the court. An artist's impression of this scene proved to be very popular and was reproduced for almost a century. Among the many bodies found in the cemetery, only a few skulls were preserved. The soil that accumulated over the millennia flattened these bones, frustrating the investigations on how the people in the death pits actually died. So, for a long time, Bully's poison hypothesis held tight, until researchers at the Penn Museum decided to find a solution to the mystery once and for all. The few preserved remains were studied under a hospital CT scanner. The results proved Bully's theory wrong. The retainers may have accepted to be sacrificed willingly, but their death wasn't peaceful at all. A pointy object had been used to shatter their skulls. The bone damage was consistent with a battle hammer found in one of the tombs. The CT scan has revealed a previously unknown detail. The bodies of the sacrificed persons were heated or smoked to enhance preservation. Another technique was used too, the use of mercury to preserve bodies, which was previously observed only in ancient China. It's quite likely that the funerary rituals were very long, and therefore decomposition had to be stopped in any way possible. These elite funerals were serious staged events, with music, wailing and feasting, and they could last for days. The enigmatic veil shrouding the significance of these sacrifices remains an unsolved mystery, as does the true identity and story of Queen Puavi. We know very little about who she truly was. Yet, hope lingers on the horizon, as the archaeologists at her may one day unearth hidden relics and forgotten ruins, shedding new light and revealing long-awaited clues. But what we know for sure is that, at first glance, the Royal Cemetery of Ur may pique our curiosity with its enigmatic allure. However, what is truly interesting is not the death of these people, but the vibrant lives they once lived. While these relics and ceremonies may seem like they belong in a somber cemetery, they actually offer a glimpse into an amazing past. Poabizur was once a city full of life.